Welcome to Talking Industrial Automation, a podcast where you get to know the people who make modern industrial automation possible. You'll get to hear from CSIA system integrators and industry partners to get a better understanding of how they help their clients solve process challenges and how they earn success in their careers. Along the way, we'll touch on system integration best practices, technology, trends, and challenges. Whether you are a manufacturer, end user, supplier, or system integrator, you will enjoy the insights CSIA members bring to this podcast. Let's get started. Hi, my name is Lisa Richter, the host of Talking Industrial Automation, a podcast where you get to know the people who make modern industrial automation and processing possible. In today's episode, we're talking industrial automation with Bruno Wilson, a regional sales manager and business development engineer for Encoder Products Company, a 50-year-old designer and worldwide manufacturer of motion sensing devices based in Sagal, Idaho. Bruno's experience includes business processes, human resources and administration, research and development, manufacturing engineering, market analysis, sales, and business development. An up-and-coming leader, Bruno represents the next generation, not only for Encoder, but also the industry. Bruno, welcome to the podcast. Hey, Lisa. Thanks for having me. So why don't we start with you explaining how you chose a career or why you chose a career at an organization that manufactures devices for the automation industry of all things. Well, I was uh, intrigued and curious. And when I went in for my interview with the Encoder Products Company, I saw a huge opportunity for growth. I was surprised to find such a thriving organization in a rural location, and the location was very desirable to me. And then as I walked around and learned what they did, I could definitely see why the device was needed in industry, specifically automation. And I got excited to apply my education and grow in other areas that I consider necessary for success being that EPC is still a privately held organization, relatively small company in terms of employees, I saw that I might have the opportunity to experience maybe job duties outside your typical engineering job description. So I'm intrigued by the the location as well. Tell me a little bit about Sagal, Idaho. I'll describe the drive heading north uh, on the main highway, 95 in Idaho, to get to Sagal. You're driving along, you see nothing but mountains. Every now and then there's a wheat field. Uh, there's deer crossing the road. There's herds of elk on the mountainside. You see bald eagles everywhere you go. And then seemingly out of nowhere, a 100,000 square foot building pops up off the left side of the highway and the parking lot is full of cars. <laughs> uh, so why in the world, I mean, how did that happen that that, I don't know, field of dreams kind of thing happened with a building in the middle of quote unquote nowhere <laughs> that's a good question um our founder bill watt i believe he grew up in the sandpoint sagal area of northern idaho and he eventually went to work for a company in southern california probably silicon valley and he decided that you know what i want to go back home or at least back to this place that he experienced in the past because of its beauty and connection to nature and the ability to go from work to the outdoors in, you know, basically your commute home. And he founded the company in 1969 in Sagal, Idaho. How big is Sagal? Sagal, uh, I wouldn't call it big at all. It's small. <laughs> um, I don't know the population of Sagal, but Sandpoint, I think, sits, you know, under 10,000 population. That's the next biggest town uh, closest to Sagal. Sagal's probably on the order of a thousand, maybe less. Okay. Well, thank you for indulging me in that tangent. Um, back to business here. What is the biggest benefit CSA membership uh, brings to Encoder Products Company? Or do you use the acronym EPC? I heard you use that earlier. Yeah, we use EPC. Encoder Products Com- Company is kind of a mouthful, but um, you know, definitely describes what it is we do there. We make encoders. <laughs> Um, so I would say the biggest benefit of the CSIA membership was immediate exposure to a particularly complicated segment of industry, um, the integrator. The integrator is a very diverse bunch. There's no two integrators exactly alike. They all have their own needs, their own requirements, and their own customer base and their own area of expertise. 
So it was necessary for us to subscribe to the CSIA so that we can address all of their needs and understand what it is uh, they want and need to be successful in their jobs. What kinds of trends and challenges are you seeing in industrial automation right now? The industrial Internet of Things and their protocols, what we're finding is every manufacturer has their own flavor, and I think she is well aware of this, and supporting those protocols is a challenge, of course. Um, Then there's the data collection and interpretation. Uh, Big data is huge right now. It's, It's trending, if you will, to gather this data, even though a lot of companies don't necessarily use every bit of data that they're gathering they just store it, say, in the cloud, for instance, because they don't know what they will need later on to be able to make a statistically driven decision. And that's where the challenge of interpretation comes in. You have all these data points, and then you need to understand how they connect and what they mean when you're looking at them. And that's something integrators have become good at. Another one that we're noticing is extended lead times. And this kind of falls back into that data collection and interpretation as well. MRP processes have to be very accurate. Lead times are getting longer and more extended, and your MRP processes have to be able to accurately predict months, maybe even years in advance, what your needs are going to be to continue to support and supply product to your customer base. Another challenge, I would say, is marketing noise filtration and access to the decision makers in order to present them with the solutions they need. And I'll give you an example. Uh, Recently, we had a relatively large company come to us. They needed encoders on the order of several hundred, maybe even a thousand or more a year. And one of the first things they said, they came to our facility, visited us on site. They wanted to evaluate our manufacturing processes and just understand who we were as a company before they placed a large PO for a large quantity of encoders long-term And one of the first things they said when we sat down was, how have we never heard of you? And this surprised me. (laughs) Just because, well, we're encoder products company and they needed an encoder and they've been buying encoders for years, but they would never heard our name. And this is a challenge, I think, in industry moving forward is there's, there's so much information available to decision makers How do you really weed through all of that information and figure out who you need to be talking to to find the solutions that you need? And this is something that uh, CSIA is actually helping us overcome by putting us in contact with the decision makers at the various integrators. Do you want to connect with the best in the business? Then the CSIA Industrial Automation Exchange is for you. With thousands of systems integrators and suppliers, the exchange is the one-stop spot for end users, suppliers, and integrators to connect and do business. Whether you are an end user looking for qualified system integration or suppliers, or an integrator or supplier trying to reach customers, the CSIA Industrial Automation Exchange is the place to be. See for yourself at www.csiaexchange.com. So you mentioned that there's quite a few challenges coming up. Um, and so what do you, what is Encoder Products Company doing to keep up with these trends and overcome these challenges? Well, I, I guess it makes sense just to, to address each of the, the four challenges or trends that I mentioned. Uh, I'll try to do it in order. As far as I, IoT protocols go, we're trying to support as many of them as we can. We just added EtherCAT. OpenNet is is right around the corner for us. We obviously have the SSI and the can open protocols, um, even parallel outputs in absolute format if you need it. So that's what we're doing to combat, you know, all of these protocols and the different manufacturers as they develop them. The next, uh, I believe, was data interpretation. And internally, what we do is we work to identify the most useful information up front, and then we invest our resources accordingly. Uh, we don't harvest mass amounts of data and then hopefully look to find uh, an application or, or a scenario where we can apply and analyze that data and make a decision based on it. We, we look at what decision do we need, need to make and then what data do we need to make that decision. Uh, the lead times, well, this is... <laughs> This is a a tricky one, of course, because I am a student of lean manufacturing and Six Sigma. and 
these disciplines would tell you not to hold inventory, but that's exactly what we do. But we do it for a good reason. If you look at lean manufacturing pra- practices as more of a toolbox where you use the tool when needed and you use it appropriately, then it makes sense in our case to not use, say, uh, just-in-time manufacturing practices when it comes to our material acquisition practices. Uh, We hold the inventory because when our customers need an encoder, they really need that encoder. If their system is down because they had an encoder failure, uh, hopefully not ours, uh, but if our system, if their system is down because they had an encoder failure, then they need that encoder stat so that they can get up and running again because they're losing money every minute that that machine is not running. So we we forecast out and we look at, okay, our historical data and what our customers need and, and any sort of POs that we have in place. And we maintain a healthy safety stock of all the components that we would need to make just about any variant of any encoder, of which there's millions, by the way, in our catalog. And then as far as marketing noise and filtration, um, well, we subscribe and we actively engage in organizations like the CSIA. Nice. How has EPC grown or changed in the past year? And what do you expect for your company in the next year, 24 months? Well, just uh, recently, we've made strides towards keeping pace with technolo- technological advancement, and we recognize that industry around us is changing very rapidly. And in response to that, uh, we've made a decision to become more nimble and and responsive to the customer's needs. We're not afraid to modify our products to meet the application demands of any customer. I expect us to continue to be successful in supporting our customers' needs in the next 12, 24 months uh, as we release new products and add additional IIoT protocols, uh, as well as make improvements to our existing products. I should have asked this earlier, but how many employees are at EPC? Yeah, we we stay right around 150 employees and we have a global presence as well. Mm -hmm. Do you anticipate having any difficulties recruiting or retaining talent? I know I hear that from other other organizations that that's kind of one of their big challenges, right? Certainly. Yeah. So um, it's particularly challenging for us because of our location. Uh, A lot of talent doesn't necessarily want to live in a rural place. They want access to the conveniences of a, of a more uh, metropolitan area, but we appeal to new recruits and recruiting activities because of our rural location and the access to the outdoors. And in our experience, Talent, talent is hard to come by, but we do a good job at finding it and getting them hired on and retaining them as well because it is still a privately held company. It's relatively small. Um, the perks of working for a company like Encoder Products are exceptional. I think our human resources and management do a very good job at making sure that our employees stay happy in their work. Going back to your customers, Help me understand what challenges they're facing right now. Yeah, um, I would say options overload. Uh, just the the decision the decision matrix complexity is just blown up uh, in the recent years. Uh, not to mention just the sheer quantity of decisions that are made on a daily basis. I think our customers, when faced with with all the different possible encoder variants and solutions that they could choose, uh, they just find it difficult to figure out how to weight each variable and then uh, drive the decision towards the most pragmatic or the most practical or the best solution for for the application. Does that answer your question? It does. Thank you. So from a supplier perspective, why should a prospective customer hire a CSI integrator member? This is an easy one. Um, (laughs) (laughs) It comes down to the money, you know, ROI and and efficiency, uh, however you want to say it. And I'll tell a generic anecdote, albeit uh, it is generic, but bear with me. You have a bakery that makes delicious pastries and cakes, and they've been regional, but they've recently expanded to a national scale, and therefore they have to increase throughput. Well, the bakery is good at baking, right? Right. They don't have the software and the mechanics and 
uh, the integrator experience that some of these integrators have to efficiently improve their processes to continue to make that consistent, delicious cake or whatever it is they're making. And that's where they really need to understand uh, what they're trying to accomplish, understand that their strengths lie in developing the recipes and knowing what those proportions are, whether, you know, the flour, the sugar, the eggs or whatever, and then re- rely on an integrator to control those processes to a tolerable range uh, that will consistently produce their delicious treats. So you talked a little bit earlier about the history of EPC, but let's dive a little bit deeper into that and and kind of go over how the company evolved into the automation industry. So it started with Bill Watt. He's our founder, and he is the inventor of the Cube Encoder. The Cube Encoder is, as described, it's a cubic device with a shaft on it uh, that produces an incremental encoder signal. Uh, He took this novel and innovative idea and he started a company. And from what I understand, he started the company out of a workbench in his daughter's bedroom and his garage. And from there, he made a few key hires and the company began to expand. Early on, we the company got involved in uh, systems integration and developing our own systems in-house. This is kind of what gave us, as an organization, the internal understanding of integrators. Eventually, as uh, Mr. Watt hired more engineers and more personnel, they started developing more and more encoder solutions uh, to better support our own systems as well as the needs of the other system developers. We began to specialize as as I think we we figured out that hey there's an art to making these encoders and not everybody can can make them uh, to the level of quality that uh, the organization of encoder products company has sort of figured out how to over the years so so we moved away from systems integration entirely um, just focus on developing a comprehensive catalog of encoder solutions. Uh, we're now almost entirely a vertically integrated encoder manufacturer. We, we have control of our products from inception to mass production of machine components, PCBs, and sensors, all of these things that make them work. We control that. And as mentioned before, uh, we are celebrating our 50th anniversary this year. Congratulations. So going back to that very first cube encoder, was this, was mother the, um, What's that saying? Mother's necessity is the mother invention. Was that the case for that first one? He was like, gosh, if only we had a cube encoder. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. To an extent, I think, I think the necessity in terms of industry was we need this incremental signal. And from there it was, well, we also need a robust mechanical package to surround the electronics of the PCB and the disc that makes this incremental signal. And that combined with, well, what's a conveniently extruded material that we can machine and make an encoder out of. I'm just, I'm just picturing what uh, Bill would have gone through in his, in his own uh, creative process to, to come up with a cube encoder. Yeah. Uh, I know. Went, it wasn't went, really fair of me to ask you that. I was, I was being yeah. lonely with you. <laughs> I, I, I don't mind. That's, that's, I, to me, it makes sense. Logically, you know, we need the incremental signal. Um, by the way, these devices go in some pretty intense applications, uh, so they got to be robust. And he landed on, you know, an extruded aluminum housing with machine parts. It, uh, it was cubic. that had plenty of room for what was back then all hand operation in, in terms of assembling these devices. Plenty of room for uh, human fingers and hands to get in there and, and dial in the uh, air gap and, and the turn pots and all of these different components that went into fitting out a quality incremental quadrature signal. What do you think the, um, speaking of smart decisions, what do you think the smartest decision your company has made recently? Mm, I would say just our, it's not really a new decision, but it's our, our decision to continue to remain adaptable um, and seek new solutions. As I mentioned before, we we have a great applications department and we're not afraid to modify to meet the customer's needs. 
like I said, we're, we just celebrated our 50th anniversary. And I, I think along the way, it would have been easy to go, um, you know what, this, we've done enough. We're successful enough um, as an organization. And, and let's just keep this going. We got a good thing going. But, but the organization, EPC, it hasn't. It, it continually grows and changes and adapts to the marketplace, to industry, and listens to our customer base as we develop new products and new solutions. What makes EPC optimistic about the future of the automation industry? Well, in, in terms of uh, the industry itself, we're, we're just excited about the level of creativity that the industry and these integrators in particular are applying to the applications and the solutions they come up with. You, you'd be pretty impressed by some of the applications uh, companies are automating today and where our products are being used. Mm-hmm. And, and, oh, I'm sorry. Go, go ahead. Yeah, I was just going to say, what about from an organizational perspective? I guess we're optimistic about the future because uh, we have a very passionate employee base and uh, the attention to detail is just exceptional. I, I, I'm always astounded at just the questions that come up from production personnel and, and the suggestions that they make to improve our product and, and our product and our production processes. And on top of all of that, you walk around the halls of headquarters and, uh, you know, no one's depressed. Everybody's smiling. Everybody's laughing. We, we've really kind of built a community around this company, which, you know, provides security and, and provides sort of that human touch that you need to be happy. Yeah. It's a beautiful thing. Your, your, what was the guy's name? Wall created Bill Wyatt, Bill, Bill Watt, Watt. Yep. Bill Watt. Yeah. Sorry. My, my bad. That's all right. Um, okay, so what advice would you give to a prospective customer who would be researching you versus your competitors? I would say, first step, understand your needs and the differentiators that add value to your operation. After that, if you can maybe identify someone or you know someone that's used a particular manufacturer before, ask them about their experience. Lastly, I would say call and email the manufacturer and and just see how responsive they are. Eventually, you're going to need some tech support. You know, the project can't get delayed because you can't get a hold of someone. So just just see how responsive they are. If you're not a member of the Control System Integrators Association, you're missing out. Why? Why? Because CSIA can help make you more successful. I know, I know, I work for CSIA, so why would you believe me? You don't have to. Listen to partner member Steve March, Ecosystems Sales Executive Leader for the U.S. for Schneider Electric. As the the leader of our system integrator strategy for uh, Schneider Electric in the U.S., being a partner and a member of CSIA uh, is a huge benefit to my job because Our perspective as a company is all about partnering. We have rules of engagement that say we don't go to business directly uh, unless a customer demands that. Our strategy is to work with and through our partners. And so CSIA gives me the opportunity to connect with those partners, to collaborate with those partners, to maintain contact with those partners, to strategize with those partners. It's, uh, It's just a huge benefit to have this community to be a part of. For more information about the benefits of joining CSIA, visit www.controlsys.org backslash join. How do you describe what you do when someone who is unfamiliar with industrial automation asks you, like if you're at the dinner party or whatever, and you have to explain to a lay person what it is, what it is that you do, what do you say? I usually start pretty simple. Uh, I, I help make a sensor where I work for a company that makes a sensor that helps automate industrial processes like packaging, manufacturing, robotics. And I'll describe it a little bit. I'll say it's similar similar to, say, the tachometer on your car, but comes with uh, more bells and whistles. And if they're interested, 
you know, then I'll describe maybe an application of where encoders are used, like how a solar panel tracks the sun um, or a bottle filling out operation. And then beyond that, if they're still interested, which is unlikely, um, or if they're stuck next to me on an airplane, I'll uh, drill down into the nitty gritty detail. I feel bad for the poor soul that gets stuck next to me on an airplane. <laughs> Does your mom know what you do? What would your mom say you do? <laughs> Mom, my mom doesn't even know what kind of engineer to tell people. <laughs> <laughs> oh, God bless her. She knows. She, I've told her. I've showed her the product. And, <laughs> and uh, you know, she, yeah, she. you, you got to have a certain technical disposition, I think, to really appreciate what an encoder is. <laughs> <laughs> Mom's rule. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Um, okay, so so what's unique about how you approach a project? Well, as an organization, we we really just get right in there. We're very hands on. We we ask questions. Um, if it merits, we get on site to take a look at the application. Um, we'll even point out possible pitfalls uh, just to help educate our customer. And we're always willing, like I said, to modify for the application, which I think is is sort of uh, unique to Encoder Products Company because we're so adaptable in that way. Um, but it's it's all in an effort to to make sure that our customer has the best possible solution. Why do you get uh, repeat customers? Like why do, why do customers return to you for project after project? Yeah, I think it's our differentiators, our, our quality, our consistency, our responsiveness our adaptability and our lead times. We we closely monitor our quality metrics and we're always 99.5% of the time sending quality product out the door, uh, which then goes into our consistency. Our customers can expect to get the same product over and over and over again. Um, then our responsiveness, uh, you know, go ahead, call, call in code products company, um, listen to the automated greeter and, press a few buttons and you'll get a person on the phone or send an email and someone will respond to that email or call you. And their lead times, we standard four to six days, any standard variant out of the catalog, four to six days, and the option to expedite as many as 10 pieces, uh, same day, one day or two day, which is, uh, that's saying something in the encoder world, just because every product is built to order. There is no such thing as a standard encoder. Is there an industry product or discipline that EPC specializes in? Oh yeah, it's it's right in the name. Encoders, both incremental and absolute, linear and rotary. From a supplier perspective, how should a customer go about choosing a system integrator? Yeah, start start by having a clear vision of what the end result should be. And I know it's cliche for an engineer to quote Einstein, but and I'm probably going to butcher it. But I'm going to do it anyways for do the podcast. All right. I believe in you. Go for it. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Einstein said, if, if faced with a problem that the world ended on, I would spend 55 minutes defining that problem and five minutes seeking a solution. And, and that's really what you should do before you start reaching out to an integrator is understand what your needs are and what you want the end result to be. It'll set you up. For success when it really comes time to choosing an integrator to partner with in whatever project you're working on. Beyond that, really, really make use of the CSIA website. It has tools like the find an integrator that allow you to search and sort based on what their areas of expertise are, maybe even geographic location, and narrow down, you know, come up with a short list of prospective integrators. And once you have that short list of prospective integrators, take a look at their portfolios and their capabilities. There's a um, good chance their website's going to have examples of their work and projects they worked on might be very similar to your own. And then after that, start a dialogue. These these integrators are a real honest group of professionals. And if they can't help you, there's a good chance that they know another integrator that can. I found that too. That generally speaking, the people that I met run into, at least CSIA members, are generally kind and want to help, you know, which I don't know why I should be shocked at that. I, I guess I, I said something about me that I am. I don't know. Um, yeah. So without, go well, ahead. I was, sorry, I was just going to say, I think they're born problem solvers. I, yeah. 
lot of these companies are founded by engineers that that are excited by finding a solution um, and that that just gets kind of ingrained in in the culture and who they are as an organization yeah it's 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 very satisfying and and comforting to be at the like the annual um executive conference because you know whatever goes wrong there's probably 20 guys there who can figure it out and solve it (laughs) That's right. Yeah, you're surrounded by a, a group of IT, yeah. software, and engineering professionals. <laughs> they do not shirk from a challenge, that's for sure. No. So without naming names, unless you want to or are allowed to, tell us about a project that was super challenging and what you did to solve the customer's problem. So I should probably should mention this in the in the trends and challenges within industry, but uh, still safety ratings is is one of those specifically this need for redundant feedback when it comes to uh, encoder signals. We had a customer that needed to reach a certain sill safety level because they uh, are an AGB or you know, AMR, however you want to say it, manufacturer, and uh, their platform is collaborative. It's, it's intended to work around people, so they really needed to meet this sill safety requirement, and so they needed a incremental encoder signal and an absolute encoder signal. Um, we were able to design a unique solution, albeit very quickly and efficiently as well, um, giving them both outputs in a single package that they can mount up to their motor and comply with the safety standard that they were looking to comply with. So at the top of the show, I introduced you as an up-and-coming leader, which kind of begs the question then, where do you see yourself in the future and, and where do you want to be? What do you want to be when you grow up? <laughs> what do I want to be when I grow up? Yeah, that's uh, a question I ask myself on a daily basis. Um, well, let me let me give you a a somewhat uh, sarcastic response. Next month I'll be in Pack Expo in Vegas. October I'll be in in uh, Indianapolis at TechCon. January I'll be in Orlando attending the A3 conference. And in May, I'll be in New Orleans uh, attending the CSIA conference. But that, So that's physically where I will be. Right. You're being very literal, like most engineers. I got it. I got yeah. it. <laughs> uh, no, be, beyond that, you know, I, I see myself uh, helping drive decisions in industry, having, having really listened to the experience and, and knowledge base of the automation community and integrating that wisdom in with my own experiences and observations as I grow as a professional. Um, Mm -hmm. What gets you out of bed in the morning? Like, are you super excited? Like, oh, I get to go do. mm." (laughs) (laughs) Um, I I don't know what the motivating factor is for me, but, but I like a new day and I I like it. I get a certain level of satisfaction out of crossing that to do item off of my list. Mm -hmm. That seems like pretty insignificant and uninspiring <laughs> method of motivation, but, uh, but it's true. And I, I think it's all these little action items that you complete that that ultimately create ten years from now success. That's it's it's the little things that define success over a very long period of time. That's it for today's episode of Talking Industrial Automation. If you are interested in learning more about Encoder Products Company or Bruno Wilson, you can find them at the Industrial Automation Exchange at www.csiexchange.com. Thanks for listening, and thank you, Bruno, for joining me today. Thank you, Lisa. If you enjoy this podcast, please subscribe in iTunes, Stitcher, Google Play, or wherever you listen to podcasts. You can also help others find us by sharing your favorite episodes with colleagues. Thanks for listening to the Talking Industrial Automation Podcast. Thanks also to bensound.com for the music bumpers. Until next time.